I invite you to turn in your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 8. And that should be no surprise to you. Romans chapter 8. <clears throat> We're reading beginning at verse 18 down through verse 30. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself also will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. <coughs> For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. For in hope we have been saved, but hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he has already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we wait eagerly for it. In the same way the Spirit also helps our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we should, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good, to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his Son, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called, and these whom he called, he also justified, and these whom he justified, he also glorified. Father, we ask that you would guide us this morning in your word as we consider these tremendous thoughts and truths with regards to our eternity. We pray, Father, that you would take the words that are spoken this morning and use them to build up the hearts of your people and fix our vision, Father, on Christ himself and that which is to come. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Paul has been speaking about the whole issue of suffering and the reality of suffering and how that impacts us in our present day life and present day situation. He talks about us suffering with him in verse 17. And if children, heirs also, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. We suffer with him, so that we may be glorified with him. The suffering spoken of by Paul in that verse relates back to verses 13, 14, and 15, where he talks about those who are being led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Those who are being led by the Spirit of God are those who are in cooperation with the Holy Spirit, putting to death the deeds of the body. And so the suffering that Paul speaks of in that first word, suffering, in verse 18, is referring to the suffering that comes our way because of a godly lifestyle. It is not just simply being led by the Spirit in determining what my occupation should be, who my wife should be, what I should be doing with my life, etc. But we're being led by the Spirit in a warfare, and it is a warfare against the flesh, the deeds of the body. And when you begin to deal with those deeds, you become a different person, you stand out in the culture. And so as a result of that, you will suffer persecution. Peter mentions that they will malign us because they don't understand who we are or why we are the way we are. And so there is a suffering for righteousness sake. Jesus said, blessed are those who suffer for righteousness sake. That's the suffering that Paul is speaking of there. 
But then he expands on that. He talks not only, not only about suffering with him, <clears throat> he talks about the sufferings of this present age in verse 18, and that would be just about anything from circumstantial things in our lives, health issues, financial issues, issues within our culture, political issues, uh, economic issues, and so on, or it could be things that are happening in creation, earthquakes, famines, pestilence, disease, all of those sorts of things. The creation is suffering, and that's Paul's picture. He says this creation is suffering. But he says in the first part of that verse 18, I consider that the sufferings of this time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed. We talked about the suffering last week. This week I want us to attend, pay our, uh, focus our attention on the issue of the glory that is to be revealed. Paul says, I consider. That word, consider, is the word that we get our English word logic from. It is a weighted opinion, considering all of the facts, evaluating them, assessing them, looking at the reality of the situation. And Paul says, when I do that, when I understand the glory that is to come for God's children, the sufferings aren't worthy to be compared to that glory. That's an incredible statement, an incredible statement. We noticed last week that suffering does actually work to produce an eternal weight of glory. We find that in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. There is an eternal weight of glory that is being produced by the very sufferings that we are going through. In other words, the suffering we go through is destroying the outward man, but the suffering we are going through is also developing the inward man. So the very suffering that we experience that creates pressure on the vessel that we're living in is also being used to shape and form the inner man so that we will be prepared for an eternity with God. There is the inner man, there is the outer man, there is the treasure, there is the earth and the vessel. And what Paul is saying here in Romans 8 is that that glory that is to be revealed to us is not worthy to be compared with these troubles or these issues that we're facing. If you notice in verse 18, he uses the word glory, and then in verse 30, he finishes with the word glory, and they're kind of like bookends on this portion of Scripture. And as soon as you notice that, you begin to understand that the real thing that Paul is trying to emphasize in this portion of Scripture is the glory, not the suffering. He begins with glory in verse 18, he ends with glory in verse 30, so everything in between this has to do with this whole issue of the glory that is to be revealed. If you notice in verse 19, he talks about the revealing of the glory of the sons of God. For the anxious longing of the creation awaits eagerly the revealing of the sons of God. And he's talking there about the glory. The glory has to do with the revealing of the sons of God. In verses 20 and 21, he says this, the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will also be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And there he uses that word again. And we are ones that are eagerly waiting this glory. Not only is creation waiting for it, we are waiting for it. Notice in verse 23, and not only this, but also we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption as sons, the redemption of our body. So the glory that he's referring to here that is to come has to do with the redemption of our bodies. 
It has to do with our bodies being set free from the sin that dwells within. It has to do with the whole reality that these bodies, these mortal bodies that we are living in, shall be taken off and they shall be replaced with an immortal frame, an immortal body. That is the redemption of our bodies. And then in verses 24 and 25, he says this, For in hope we have been saved. But hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he has already seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, with perseverance we eagerly wait for it. So he is equating this glory with hope. Uh, the glory that we are going to experience is that which constitutes our hope. That is what we are looking to, looking forward to, or anticipating. We are anticipating the glory that awaits us. Well, what is that glory? What is he talking about? As I began to examine this, and other scriptures started to come to my mind, I turn to 1 John chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, where we read these words. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of God, and such we are, and for this reason the world does not know us, because it did not know him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, and it has not yet appeared as yet what we will be, but we know that when he appears, we will be like him, because we will see him just as he is. You see, the glory that we are looking forward to is the glory of a transformation into the likeness of Christ. That is what we are anticipating. You'll notice in verse 3, everyone who has this hope, it's the same hope that Paul was referring to in Romans chapter 8. The hope is this, that we will be like him. We will be like him because we will see him just as he is. The moment that Christ returns and the moment that the child of God looks at Christ, at that instant in time, he will be conformed to the likeness of Christ. So the picture is this. Paul in the book of Romans is talking about justification by faith, the reality that through justification we have been united with Christ, we are one with him, we have been baptized into his death, experienced death, burial, and resurrection in Christ. The Holy Spirit has come to live within us. And the Holy Spirit now is working within us to do what? He is working within us to conform us to the image of Christ. So the process that was set in motion through justification is what we call sanctification, becoming holy, becoming Christ-like. And the glory that is going to be revealed, listen people, the glory that is going to be revealed to you and to me when we look at him is we become exactly like him. Perfect. Perfect. Nothing lacking. Absolutely complete. Needing nothing. Lacking nothing. Desiring nothing but him. He becomes everything. <coughs> We look at him, and the process is complete. That is the glory that we look forward to. How often have you and I struggled with our imperfections? Wishing and longing that somehow, in some way, I might finally rid myself and shed myself of all of this garbage that identifies me too often. The longing of the heart of God's people is holiness and purity. The longing of God's people is completeness. The longing of the people of God is fulfillment. Paul says in Colossians 3 that in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And you are filled full in him. That's the glory. The glory is when we are filled full in him. That's why the scriptures say there's not going to be any tears, there will be no sorrow, there will be no pain, 
There will be no suffering. There will be joy. There will be worship. There will be praise. There will be things that our minds can't even think of right now because we are still encased in this body. But when Christ returns and we look at him, this body is going to be transformed. It's going to be a spiritual body. And I don't understand that. It's a, it's a contradiction of terms. How can you have spiritual and body? But it is. That's what's going to happen. When Jesus was resurrected, everybody recognized him. Not only that, he told Thomas to put your finger into the holes in my hand and thrust your fist into my side. The scars were still there, but he appeared and he disappeared. He was there and he was gone. It was a spiritual body. I don't know. I don't understand that. I don't know how it's going to work. But I do know this, that the thing I long for, the thing that you long for as a child of God is to be like him. And I can guarantee you, Paul says that, whom he has justified, then he has sanctified. Whom he has sanctified, then he has glorified. Speaking of it as though it had already taken place. So the glorification is a settled fact. And I have a fly that's just... <laughs> <laughs> doesn't want to disappear that's the glory the glory is not the streets of gold the glory is not the pearly gates the glory is not the majesty of the universe the glory is Christ that's the glory that we look forward to Spurgeon said this. The streets of gold will have small attraction to us. The harps of angels will but slightly enchant us compared with the king in the midst of the throne. He it is who will rivet our gaze, absorb our thoughts, and chain our affection and move our sacred passions to their highest pitch of celebrated ardor. We shall see Jesus. There is a verse that I want us to contemplate in closing. All of us probably know this verse. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 12, and it reads like this. Now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. What does that mean? You see, this is written in the context of the body of Christ and its functioning with regards to spiritual gifts. And some of the spiritual gifts that were being spoken of have to do with knowledge and wisdom and revelation. And Paul says in the midst of that whole discourse that all of those things are going to be unnecessary in the eternal kingdom. And why is that? Because then I will see face to face. And the moment I see face to face, I will know. That's what he's saying. I will know, I will be known fully. I will know fully, just as I also have been fully known. In the Enduring Word commentary, Guzik makes this comment, God knows everything about me. This is how I am known. God knows everything about me. That's how I'm known. I'm fully known. But in heaven, I will know God as perfectly as I can. It doesn't mean that I will be all-knowing as God is, but it means that I will know Him as perfectly as as I can. 
That's the glory, folks, that's waiting us. When we see Jesus, we will be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, when we see Christ, we will be transformed into his likeness. The process of salvation will be complete. And at that point, his bride is spotless, without blemish, without flaw, totally, totally complete. And when I stand there and I look at him, this feeble mind will be completely transformed and I will be able to look at Christ and I will see God and I will see him as I have never seen him before and my knowledge of him will finally be complete. I won't become all-knowing, but I will know as much of God as it is possible for me to know. Don't you long for that? Isn't that the longing of your heart? That you might see him, that you might know him, and that you might know as much of him as it is possible for you to have. That's heaven. That's what's going to happen when we get to it. I've often said to people, when I think about death, I believe that the one thing that is going to happen, without question, is that I'm going to see Christ. Immediately. Immediately I'm in His presence. And when I am in His presence, the questionings cease. Now there's a whole issue of eschatology in this, the doctrine of the last times, and I don't want to get into that. I'll let you try and sort that out as to how this is going to happen, when it's going to happen, what the sequence of events is going to be. I don't want to get bogged down in that today because it'll get us off track. We just know it's going to happen, and when it does happen, we know exactly what's going to take place. And the sequence of events I am not worried about. God has that totally under control. And he will walk me through it according to his plan. And I can tell you this, when I get to the other side, I'll know perfectly what has happened. <laughs> but on this side, it's difficult for me to figure it all out. When I pass away, when I take that final breath, I'm going to see him. I'm going to see him. And I'm told in the scriptures that when I see him, I will be like him because I will see him as he is. That's what I call hope. That's hope. Let's pray. Father, it's so easy for us to get bogged down in the mire of this world and circumstances and things happening around us. And that's been true of your people down through the centuries. But there is a freedom that the sons of God are going to experience that goes beyond description, it goes beyond understanding. And Father, we long for that day. We long to see you. We long to see your son. And we long for that perfection. And Father, as we are moving toward that goal, we pray that you might work within us in such a way that our lives will become more and more and more like Christ. Father, we know that we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. And we know, Father, also that as we look into the mirror of Christ's presence and Christ's person, on this earth that we are being transformed from glory into glory. We're becoming more and more like him. Thank you for what you're doing. And thank you for these encouraging words. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.